All right, we've got six traders here, and we're all going to talk to you about how we predict and anticipate false breakouts or flushes. Now, sometimes they're algo flushes. Sometimes they're, we don't really always know exactly what triggers them, but we see them in the market. It's nothing new, maybe more prevalent in a bear market right now than a year ago when the market was a bit more bullish. But let's talk and go around the table about some of the things that we see that help us uh, stay out of potential flushes and uh, avoid getting caught in those um, those jackknives where it pops up and then drops down. So who who wants to start this? Um, who wants to kick it off? I can take it off. Go ahead. Is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, so the first thing I look at is I look at the daily chart, right? Daily chart is important. If you look at the wake up, if there's going to be a lot of, uh, if there's, you're like, I, so I learned this from other trader. So trading is like, uh, being a detector, right? So you're like being a detective. So you just have to find traces to, uh, to, to the, the answer that you're looking for, right? So looking at daily chart, you know, uh, the historical performance of the stock. And, uh, that's the first thing. So you kind of dialed in on the short, uh, the short time, the short time frame. And then I look at uh, the pre-market action. So if the pre-market action, if there's like a spike up and then, and literally there's like a dump right after that, it means like there's a big seller coming, yeah. after, uh, coming after the stock. So it acts like a signal to me saying that, hey, you might, be, you might need to be a little cautious. And then uh, second is, okay, so right at, right at the market open, I look at how the stock performs, right? If it just dumps, right? It means, hey, no one really wants to buy this, even though, you know, you held up pretty well in pre-market, but out of the out of the uh, the market open, there's probably a big seller that came at, uh, that comes after the stock. Yeah, and then uh, and then there's I also look at the the level two to see how it kind of plays around some level. Um, if it's at a critical level and it's not actually breaking, instead like there's more sellers that actually you know come into uh, that step up the, uh, to the game, mm -hmm. then I might be a little cautious, just probably just exit out of my position. And uh, once I feel like it's safe, I can always come back in, right? There's yeah. You just lose on the, you just lose, take a paper cut instead of taking like a being smoked. Yeah. And uh, that's pretty much it. And then other, otherwise it really comes down to just the trader intuition of, of how I think the stock will behave mm. uh, based on my, my observation. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, and Henry has his $1 million badge. And so the things that I'm hearing from you are more about um, indicators for the sentiment or behavior of the stock. Is the stock going to be choppy? Is it, has it already shown something weird? And, and I totally relate to that and, and do that too. If I see a stock, one of the things, if I see it's got a history of really nasty false breakouts, if I've seen it already done it, that's done it earlier in the day once or twice, I'm like, mm -mm. cause I don't know why it's happening, but clearly we're seeing these big flush candles mm -hmm. and if a stock is shown it can do that it can do it again so i try to be cautious so it is important to learn the personality or sort of you know profile of a stock because it can start to give you some insight into okay for whatever reason there's there's someone dumping some really big share size on this mm -hmm. now if it has short sale restriction and you're seeing these flushes of fifty thousand shares well, that's not someone who's going short. That's someone who's unwinding a long position because on short sale restriction, you can't hit the bid. So then you're thinking, oh, who is unwinding a really big long position on this? Where's the stock been in the last few months? Is it what's institutional investors look like? What's the percent of inst institutional ownership? You start to put those pieces together. That's the personality profile. But go ahead. No, no, I just want to say when it comes to trading, you just have to be a little creative. Yeah. Think outside the box, right? Right, for sure. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that, um, that, that I'm thinking about that I think others will give some insight into is in the moments right before it does a false breakout, what, what are we seeing that gives us the indication that mm, maybe I should jump out? And one of the things you mentioned is some sellers reloading on the level two. And that's one, like if I'm buying a stock right under $5, 495, 495, looking for the break of five, it comes up to 98, it breaks, goes to 99, and then all of a sudden it goes from 8,000 shares on the ass to like 28,000. I'm like, okay, someone's selling right here. Let's say it buys through that. It goes from 28 to 25 to 22 to 15, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And I see a lot of green on the tape but it's not going, it's not going lower than one. Now I know there's an iceberg. 
There's a big seller hitting, hiding back there, hidden behind that 100 shares, and they're just unloading to people buying it at 98. And so when I see something like that, I want to get out because, you know, with these types of stocks with a false breakout, you don't want to be rushing to the exit with everyone else. If you do, you're going to get slippage on your exit. You want to be able, if you can, to have that intuition and that instinct to bail out early. You know, it's the first person out the door is going to be the the one who survives. Exactly. I feel like uh, what I want to add to that is you. Uh, so if you've been in the market long enough, yeah. Larry, like, you know, uh, the effect of your orders on the, this particular stock, right? Sure. If you send in this this sheer size into the stock, I should have done this. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. even if it, even when I'm watching, when I'm reading the lead level two, right? When I'm sending in my order, like if something, I, I don't have to wait until it comes down to one and it does a break to identify that here. There's an iceberg, uh, iceberg order uh, sitting on the ask. Sure. Like instantly I can be like, send in an order and this thing feels a little weirder to me. Like yes. I get that insane alert saying that, hey, there might be a hidden order, yep. like a hidden seller on the ass. Right. Like, let me just, let me just take it easy mm -hmm. and I'll step back and then see what the stock wants to do. Right. So Maybe I'm wrong. The sec And I, I have that yeah. too. So sometimes as soon as you get in, if you see 20,000 shares on the ask, or even if you don't see, you see only 100 shares on the ask, but you do a 20,000 share order, you're going to expect you're probably going to get four or five cents of slippage. Mm -hmm. If you get no slippage and you fill the whole thing right there, <laughs> then you realize, wait a second, I just bought from a hidden seller. So in that moment, I sometimes hesitate to just bail right out because I, of course, I don't know how big the seller is mm -hmm. and maybe it'll break. But I often feel that the instinct to exit is the right one because there's a wall there and I just don't know how big it is. So then, you know, I guess the question is how strong is the setup? How strong is the stock otherwise? Does that, does that override the fact that there is a seller here? I don't know. Because other traders will notice. They'll, other traders will start to see that hidden seller. And then that, that's kind of like, you know, the, there's now, now you've got some smoke in the building but uh, you've also realized that like three of the doors are like nailed shut. <laughs> it's like, wait a second. Hey, do you guys see what I see here? Because something's not looking right. Because then all of a sudden you've got the sell side and everyone buying is buying from that seller. And then if there's no bid support, when all those people turn around and sell, you're going to get that flush. Mm -hmm. So when you have those hidden sellers, that's a, that's a really important one. And you really cannot see hidden sellers without using level mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm which is why I do feel yeah. level two is important in trading. Um, I suppose if you really have a great entry off of support, purely based on the chart, maybe you wouldn't need to worry about a hidden seller at that spot as much, but that's just not how I trade. Or interesting enough is you, uh, sometimes if you look at the, uh, the resistance level on the chart, you can identify where you can kind of like guess where the hidden seller will be. Right at a particular or a, a particular critical point um, on the chart. Right, that's where most likely the sh the hidden seller will you know stack their order there to make sure that it doesn't pass this point. Right. Right. Absolutely. No. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know what? Hidden buyers do the same thing. They'll put a huge buy order at VWAP. Yeah. Because that's a that's a psychological support level. If they can hold that level with well, whether or not they can really hold that level mm -hmm. with just one order. But if they can at least put out bid support and be a buyer at that level, maybe they'll get some shares at that level, which is a good spot to be in. Maybe mm -hmm. it breaks and they have to cut it. But if not, then they're in there right at support. So exactly. yeah, and, and inverse with shorting off of like a critical daily pivot, something like that. I have uh, something to add. Yeah, um, please. Mar Mar Marcelo. <laughs> Marcelo, yeah. <laughs> Specifically about you, what you were saying, that there's some short sellers or, or people taking profit that, you know, mindfully put orders in those critical levels but i've also noticed in another way to identify false breakouts why, by use, utilizing level two is depending how strong a breakout is when you get to a breakout level uh, yeah. let's say you know let's say higher day is five dollars and then we go to five dollars and we only break by two cents that's a clear indicator that that's just going to immediately be a bull trap trap some you know newbie traders that are jumping way too late for the breakout on yep. the other side of the breakout and then you know slamming back down all the way down to to law of day let's say because at the at the end of the day what i like to think is what is the other side what is the trader on the other side really thinking what is the emotions on the other what is happening on the other side of the trader usually the other side of my trade is a short seller mm -hmm. and if i'm thinking that 
a short sale is going to be short off of high of day. They're probably going to have their, sh their stop loss at high of day. Their stop loss is that they have to cover and close the position. That means buying, right? Yep. So whenever we have a strong breakout, they are very close to stopping out. So the price action we see at that level really is going to determine whether if they stop, stop out and cover mm -hmm. or if they just hold the position because they know that it's going to reverse off of that level and even add to that level depending how strong or weak the, the breakout is. So for example, if we break five by 10 cents, 15 cents immediately, if I was a short seller, I would immediately be covering my position because that is too strong of a breakout. And I would right. have fear, you know, getting caught off, getting caught on a huge push. Yeah. As a long bias trader, I see that weakness on the level two and I would probably add for, for you know, for another leg, for another push for, to 550 or something like that. Totally. That's scenario one. Scenario two is, we break by two cents, we attempt to hold five. Short sales haven't covered, they're just watching at the price action. And he's like, is this gonna be a false breakout? Is it not? And then it starts to reverse, then they don't cover. There's no buying balling up top and all we see is more selling. And then you get that, imme that immediate, you know, immediate flush right. and reversal, bird trap. Yep, beginner traders bail out, panic sell. Short sales get more aggressive and then they, they just, add to it. Exactly. Now you've got the rejection off of a critical level, which can often on a momentum stock, that can be high of day. Right. So that rejection, then it's not just because you would think, oh, well, they'll just cover when it drops down. But inversely, they could just add more, exactly. keep their stop at the top. And now you're good unless it comes back up and breaks through that high. Right. And right. then you have a second attempt at that level, which we saw on one of them today. And then, yeah, because as a, most of you guys here in the chat room or, or taking a look at this video are probably long bias traders. You got to think it at the, as the other way around. You're long the dip and your stop loss is going to be somewhere at support. If you see a stock come down, you have two choices: either I add against my support, or if I see, or, or if I clearly see that this level doesn't hold, I bail out. When you bail out, you sell. You probably cr create a flush because a lot of people are gonna be are gonna be selling with you, stopping out, and all that. But if you see that the level just comes back down, does a, does a little bit of a double bo double double bottom, that's even a better opportunity for you to add to your position against support and then ride the way back up. The exact same thing is happening. This is happening. On the on the opposite side when we are you know trying to go along against high of day short sales are in in that stock hoping for a double top we do if we do the get the double top they're just gonna get they're just gonna get even more aggressive piling more short and then you know create that huge flush of a you know of a false breakout or something like that yeah so you know always thinking about the psychology and where's the head of of this of the person on the other side of the trade always helps yeah i like that i can add a little bit sure too. When I think of those big, nasty whip false breakouts, like that's what I'm thinking right now. I think of them in like three primary areas. Like we have like pre-market right at 9.30 when the bell rings and then after the market at market open. So pre-market, from my experience, what I've usually seen is stocks that I'm interested in that look prime for a huge breakout, maybe like skipping dollars a share, but volume is very, very, very light. Um, there are three things, I, two things I like to look for in each instance, um, multi time frame alignment and the volume. So say, for example, pre-market, you see a breakout and the volume is very light. If you do not see more volume coming in at the breakout, odds are it's going to be a false breakout and you're going to see a bid drop and you're going to see the stock come right back down to your potential entry price or lower. So. I always make to, like to make sure I see volume coming in, especially pre-market. Um, at the bell at 9:30, you know that we're always we're always prone to seeing those big whips. Um, you know, 9:30, 9:31 a.m. And for those types of um, those types of whips, I like to manage them by just taking a very very quick profit. So if you're anticipating a level of like maybe three dollars and fifty cents breaking um for a gap and go trade let the let the stock move up a little bit and trim most of it off and leave just a little bit left so that way if it does continue to keep going you have a little bit of your skin left in the game if it flushes maybe you get out on the flush but you're already got some profit and you can even get out break even mm -hmm. the big one for me is when you're trading after the market opens and we see, you know, we see them time and time and again, those big flush whips. Um, but I always resort back to looking at multi time frame alignment and the volume. So if we've had a nice gap and go trade and you're looking prime for another breakout or another leg up, if the stock really is extended, just know you are more likely apt for a false breakout. And that's not to say that the stock can't continue. 
But again, with volume, if you see the volume coming in, then it's more likely to take that second leg up. So even when you're in those tight little consolidations, if you see like a declining volume profile, especially on the five minute chart, you're more likely to see like a pop and a fade. Um, if you see like a slight ramp up of volume during the consolidation, then you're more likely to have at least a more resolved breakout. So I always look for multi time frame alignment and the volume profile. And those are two kind of, you know, rules of thumb that I use. But of course, it always depends on everything else, whether yeah. there's a hidden seller right at that level, and sure. you're already in the trade. Sure. You know, there's all of those factors, but yeah. like big level picture. Yeah. If you anticipate getting into a trade, at least look at those two factors. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Um, generally, what I've noticed is that we'll have uh, when we're going to have a false breakout, we'll first have a nice move up and then we'll have a pullback. And then we're looking for either first candle to make a new high, which oftentimes will pop up on medium green volume, bigger than the previous red candles. And then what either happens is we see this flush back down where it ends up closing as a high volume red candle, which is then the, the pattern's broken, or it resolves and go back to, goes back to the high. If it's gonna resolve and go back to the high, it will almost always have higher volume than the first green candle of that move because more traders have seen the opportunity and are buying that pullback and any short sellers who shorted on the way up are covering because it's like, okay, this thing is strong, it's going higher. So the false breakouts tend to be uh, when, when you have lighter volume. And so I look at the volume of that candle pretty closely. That's definitely one. Uh, looking, at the hidden, looking for hidden sellers is another one. And I feel like recently, I don't know. I've seen some stocks where it's, they just start to have this feeling of getting really crowded right before the breakout spot where, where in the past, sometimes that was like a coiling pattern yeah. where they would coil up and support was coming closer and closer and closer. And then it would just start to like pull away. And that's almost like an obvious spot to be a buyer too. Yeah, you have that. it is. And I, I think that I don't know if it's like a liquidity trap or some type of market maker algo where we see that we see it break and then what we'll often see is this big dump of, of order of shares sell. So it breaks and then it dumps and either there's enough retail traders out there that are going to bid it up. So when it dumps, they're they're absorbing those that sell and then it goes higher or it jackknifes. Mm -hmm. So it pops up and then it reverses and then of course, if it, if it reverses, then that usually marks the high right there. And now you've got this chart where you have a high volume red candle, it's a reversal. So I've been a little bit more cautious on high volume consolidation, especially when it's been on a one minute time frame, because that that for me has seemed more recently, it's almost so obvious that it's like, that's where the, that's where the algo trap work. is. Yeah. They, they just are setting this trap for traders to fall into. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it just, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm not on the other side of the, you know, of that trade mm -hmm. to know how market makers or different institutions operate with their high frequency trading algorithms and things like that. But, and I think that's what you just said speaks well to what Henry just said as, as well, like knowing the personality of the stock. So if it did it once, it's more likely than not going to do it again. But also if we're in a time in the market where these patterns just aren't resolving the way we a long bias trader would want them to. Yeah. Maybe be a little more cautious around those breakout points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that and that's the, the, something that we talked about at one of the at the last uh, trading summit that I hosted. Manoli was talking a lot about the theme. Right. What's the theme that. right now? Yeah. You know, and and we had the theme earlier this year of recent reverse splits. And then we had the theme of recent IPOs. And then we had the theme of Chinese, Chinese. IPOs, mm -hmm. which was like the first two on steroids. <laughs> and so, you know, but previously we've had, in thinking back, we had themes of anything related to COVID-19 during an Ebola outbreak in 2014, or maybe it was 15, we had anything related to biohazard suits. During the shooting in um, Ferguson, and I don't remember what year that was, there was uh, digital ally and taser the, for the body cameras. The, that was a theme, that the security. oil theme. industry. And then there's stuff, energy. Yeah. We had the big energy theme earlier this year. So 
And sometimes the theme is uh, sector, sometimes it's price, sometimes um, it's it's like a technical setup, like a SPAC or a reverse split. Uh, then we had meme stocks, the meme theme. So I think it's important to keep an eye on that. And, and I don't know to what extent, you know, an, an algo responds to stocks that are sort of in the theme if they risk off and just kind of let those stocks go crazy and don't try question. to yeah. do stuff or if those stocks just go crazy because they're the theme and retail traders are just swarming them and are getting so excited that they just overpower it and it just goes crazy it, it's one of these things it's always hard to know is it this or is it that but uh but but when you're lacking a theme when you're in between themes uh, or when a theme is sort of fading, that can be a time where you start to have traps as traders got comfortable thinking this thing was gonna keep working, mm -hmm. like recent mm -hmm. reverse splits or mm -hmm. something like that. And what we've seen on those recent reverse splits is they pop up and they come right back yeah. down. And, you know, it's the obviously there's so many complexities of the market in terms of market participants, including, you know, algos that we don't fully understand so and even the people that understand it the understand theirs the very best don't understand necessarily exactly how the competition is running the ones that they have so i mean it is very complex and, and really all we can do is try to draw insights like you said be a detective what are the insights that we can draw from the price action of this stock what's its behavior been like so far today what's the theme of the market uh, you know, is it showing that it's trustworthy? And if it is, I'm going to trade aggressively. When it's not, that's when I say I probably won't trade this stock at all because I can't manage my risk when a stock is shown me. And we had one uh, earlier this week, or maybe it was last week, where it went from I bought it at 497 for the break of five. I was there was already 180,000 share, share seller at 508. Mm -hmm. And it, and it did get bought up. I was like, good, it broke. It goes to 515. I was like, okay, I'm going to take my profit. And then it dropped to 445 and was pinned at the halt down. Someone, it looks like someone market ordered a 200,000 share order and just blew through the tape and everything was red and just w swept the book. And I, after that, I was just like, you know what? I already wasn't sure about this because of that big seller. I thought that was odd. Now I'm certain that I don't want to touch this again. And you know, it did end up going higher, but I just felt like I couldn't touch it. And I can't manage my risk when a stock is showing me has the potential to flush 75 cents a share. Because where where's the safe entry? I mean, maybe really, really at support, but even that broke support. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I so I don't know. Do you uh, anyone else want to share some tips on avoiding false breakouts? Timmy, um, you got one? Or Nick? Yeah, actually, Timmy, go um i mean i agree with pretty much everything everyone else has said the only one i would add is which maybe doesn't come up quite as much with just a lot of the stocks not really making sustained moves over a long period of time but i just used to always see it was like that fourth tap that we would get the big false breakouts and yeah. i'm just like yeah you see it it's like oh it's not going it's not going it's not going and that tap, fourth tap, one tap. breaks for two cents like marcella was saying that's <laughs> that a huge drop and it's right. just like you know i got caught in a false breakout literally today and and it was came back down and you end up stopping out you know pretty much right at the low and that ends up being support and it's just how it is right now you know it double bottomed right at that low and then came up and the third the third attempt is when it actually went through that level. So, you know, that's something that I got to pay attention to. Same with what Henry was saying with the overall stock and other stocks like we had earlier this week with ENSC, you know, just false breakout went yeah. pretty much full circle. And once you see that pre-market, it doesn't really make you feel very good about the next thing that pops mm -hmm. up. So in the past, the that tap, 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 and then break, I mean, that used to be like a classic flat top breakout pattern, right. ascending support, we would, we would tap, tap, tap and break. And I used to think of it as like, we're, there's, there's clearly a seller, some resistance there. Maybe it's at a daily level or whatever it is. So we're kind of like eating into that seller, boom, boom, boom. And then when we break, it's like, okay, we're off. And now I really just see that as being inherently weak that we have that resistance there and we tap it once, we can't break it, that's not great. A second time, still can't break it. Wow, it's a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. A third time, wow, this thing is hard to break. A fourth time, we break by two cents. Uh-oh, that's all. Another seller's lined up there, three cents higher. 
everyone that accumulated for that breakout, they're just like, I'm done, I'm done. And then that's when you get the combination simultaneously of short saying, the fact that it only broke out by two cents, back to what Marcel was saying, that's the confirmation to hit this thing short and longs bail out at the same time. Now you have a double side, sell side. So uh, I hope this has been helpful for you guys in identifying some false breakouts. Nick, did you have anything you wanted to add on this? It depends on how long you want to talk about it. Well, um, I, I, can do, I can do a little Yeah, let's short, do like uh, short. two minutes. Um, this subject is, is I, I think what you'll notice about everyone here is that they have a direct connection with the information generated by the market and they're not kind of filtering anything through someone else's viewpoint. And that's how they're able to see what's going on. Um, so like Henry's, for example, isn't thinking like so much of like what Ross is thinking as much as he's thinking what the chart is doing. Um, and I'm thinking the same way. Um, I would say study, study the, take the worst situations that you find in the market, screenshot them and look what's before them. Like kind of just like scroll back, look what happens to set that up and to make it vulnerable and prone. Cause they don't just happen out of nowhere. I'll tell you that much. Um, I look at charts and stuff every day like this. Yeah. And there are some very, very clear things that happen over and over and over again. And it, it'll depend on like your indicators that you use, your EMAs, or your SMAs, or whatever, um, in the time frame that you're on. But there are very clear indicators, and you kind of have to find those for yourself on the charts that you're looking at. Um, and, and, and like it's it's a very personalized thing because everyone has a different way that they look at the market. So you you really have to go in and check that out for yourself. But there are patterns and there are trend lines, almost like um, I'll give you one that like is is too complex for me to use. But if you, if you draw, you can almost draw webs of trends mm. from like different points at candles. And like, there's a reaction at every point in when it touches that. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll see that in the only thing that's complex enough to do that is a computer, which market makers, and I have a theory that they're just like placing orders out at these, at these different points and these, every, every different trend area that you can draw mm -hmm. and so like i'll draw it out on the charts and it's just like a web of like these, yeah these chopsticks basically but there's reactions at every point on it. yeah so, i've done i've done the exact same thing drawing connecting two candlestick tops earlier in the day reaction, yeah and that's the thing that's crazy you some, some sometimes someone will be like hey look and they'll be like i got a dip trade at like 443 and you're like what did you get that and they had like two trend lines two candles connected from like free market right and then like way later in the day it's there and i'm like <laughs> How did you like and sometimes those odd. are the most powerful too? I mean, because they're just so obscure, but right, you know, right. it's yeah, in terms of where there's orders sitting on the book, those pivots are especially, is it, are, I think, are especially powerful because yeah, essentially what huge. those mark are highs and lows, mm -hmm. you know, so recent kind of extremes of the moves, yeah, and so the, that's where we end up seeing those orders sort of on the book is like prop. And then when you have that flush, it's like you then look back and you're like, whoa, okay, that was a double bottom with it it just happened to be on this one and maybe they had an order a little higher another candle wick and that one got taken out mm -hmm. but then the one a little further down was big enough that 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 held that, and, that that held it. and i think i think i've also noticed too that in order for a stock to go higher yeah probably about 80 80 to 90 percent of the time it has to break below the range first it, it has to break below the range it, it's like almost like it's checking like the market makers or whoever or shorts is this really like really strong yeah is this is this going to be able to go down or is this like is anyone going to start selling into this and get shaken out right and if not and if it just starts like coming back up again that's when it's like the green light for like market makers to move out of the way yeah um and they're like well we can't we can't hedge our risk against this right now because it's like it's good probably pretty strong if no one's going to sell out everyone's got a strong hand yeah so that there's just little things like that you got to really really pay attention and study and have a lot of time and knowing the level two is very important um I yeah think, i think when i think when you get into trying to um take long-term positions that's when right. all of that starts to become more and more relevant because right. you're trying not to get chopped out you're trying right. to hold for a bigger move it's like there's what is blocks. this real is this move real so like whether it's down against you or up in your favor is this a real move right like like what and what indicators can you use to 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 tell you if that's a real move yeah you got to find that for yourself everyone uses something different um, yeah i i use a 20 sma just because it doesn't move as much when i'm reviewing and i can look sure. back 
and it's more stable whereas EMA will adjust each candle in anticipation or like in reaction yeah. and yeah. it'll move and it won't be the same before the trade as after the trade. Right. right. But you have to look for something that works so you can review it. Yeah, and the thing with technical indicators is that you have to use them consistently. So, right, right. you know, exactly. if you have a technical indicator, but you only use it, you know, ten percent of the time, whatever percentage of the time it's working, it, it, you're missing a lot of it. So, I, I try, you know, one of the things that I try to do is I try to focus on things like the volume profile, which is just to look at the actual volume, the candlestick patterns. SMT. I try to keep it fairly straightforward with that, and you know, of course, we've got volume weighted average price and our moving averages. There are some traders out there that get you know pretty deep into the complexities of different indicators. And you know what? If you're that trader and it works for you, then then stick with it. At times, I will add another indicator when I'm feeling like I need like a little extra confirmation of like kind of this is a red light. Don't trade this once in this range. But when I'm in a strong market and I'm really like in the sort of flow state, mm -hmm. I'm not using those. I'm just I'm really the volume. The two. volume will negate a lot of it. Yeah, and that's the thing, the volume will. And so yeah. when you've got those high volume bars, it's going to new highs, that's going to be, I mean, that's the biggest sign of conviction for mm -hmm. me at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, even if that volume is generated by market maker, algos, the, the fact is, it, I feel like you don't have to worry about that as much because they're, so when you think about the role of a market maker, they're sitting both on the bid and the ask, they're making the market, and they get compensated by the spread. So a good market maker will buy and sell the same number of shares each day mm -hmm. and profit from the spread all day long. So and, and think day, think about think about their motivation and and what makes them money. It's the amount of trades taken in a day. Yeah. So they're more likely to keep it range bound and keep sellers trying to sell into it and buyers trying to buy into it. Sure. And and this will keep an action going all day, whereas something just going straight up. Right. That's that's a hundred percent true. But they also have to be careful because they got to hedge it, right? They got to yeah. hedge it. So if they put a big sell on the ask and a big wall of 180,000 shares, for instance, and that just gets bought up in a snap. Mm -hmm. Now they could be imbalanced in their risk and they could be effectively short, right. you know, 100,000 shares or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Then it starts skipping up five points, 10 points. They could be down a million dollars on that trade, which obviously shows why these market makers are going to use incredibly sophisticated algos to help them manage their risk. Uh, but at the same time, that that can create, um, uh, as we've seen, just this sometimes uh, choppiness in the charts as you're seeing these sort of like almost almost like little like bait and switch like attempts to stop people out. The flush to see if it oh, stops absolutely. people out. Yeah. The pop to see if it stops people out. I, I play these really low volume stuff a lot. Um, and that's probably why I don't mention a bunch. But it's like stuff where like there's almost no volume going through and I can actually see orders one by one going through the level two of like size and stuff. And I have a filter on it. So I don't yeah. see like one share orders or anything like that. Yeah. And it's like every time I hit, hit the ask and, and buy orders off the ask immediately, like the market maker pulls, pulls the bid yeah. just to test me to see if it's like, if, if I'm for real. And so like, I just go in expecting to be like down 10 cents, like almost immediately. Um, pretty much no matter what like the, that's the programming of that, that, that that's the programming of the algo because they have to make money like yeah. like and their money is when someone buys on the ass and sells on the bid yep. and if yep. they can get a better price by scaring you out i mean i would do it yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> right I'm, sure i'd take it but it's pretty complex and you probably should pay attention to it like there, there's a lot to understand and a lot to especially if you're trading on a shorter time frame where the, a lot of this stuff comes into play on the longer time frames it won't so I, I think for um, for folks tuning in, it, it, it can be easy to feel a little uh, overwhelmed with the, the complexity yeah. and the intricacies of the market. But but I think players. they I think they should be right. Like sure. you you should be aware that there's so much to, to know. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. And and then like piece by piece, you got to work through it and see how how to apply it into your day to day trade. Yeah, and I think that um, you know one of the things that is important is being able to have a good sense of the right type of stocks to trade because in any given day, there'll be some stocks that you'll find trade much more cleanly, mm -hmm. more predictably, and others that are much, much choppier. So now you've got to figure out how do I filter out the stocks that have a higher likelihood of giving these false breakouts of being choppy and I should avoid them and focus in on the ones that have the higher level of 
being, you know, more predictable. And so, you know, I, of course, use my scanners that I've developed for searching for the right stocks to trade. Even when I have my scanners, they'll give me a list of 10 stocks. I then have to manually look through them and try to gauge the, the profile of that stock and the behavior and personality of it. And the ones that I see have done false breakouts, I'll say, nope, I'm not going to trade that one anymore. That one's off the list. Another one that I might not think is going to be clean ends up having great price action. And so I focus in on that. So at the end of the day, um, you know, it's, it's super, super helpful to tune into these episodes. But what's even probably more helpful is in real time, being able to be part of a community and listen to traders who are watching all of this stuff happen because it's it's a lot that's going on in real time. And of course, there's a lot of people out there that I'm sure have traded with some degree of success without having to go as deep as we've just gone right now. But I think in more difficult markets, eventually everyone's gonna have to start looking a little bit more closely at how to identify false breakouts and how to avoid them because they create unnecessarily large losses, which reduces your profit to loss ratio, it reduces your accuracy, and all that can reduce your confidence. Mm -hmm. All right, so thanks for tuning in to this episode and we'll be back at it for the next one real soon. Hey, I wanna thank you for watching this episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. This channel has crossed over 1 million subscribers and it's thanks to viewers like you. If you wanna check out a couple other episodes that other traders are watching, you can see them listed right here. Thank you as always for tuning in and I hope you subscribe to the channel.